Well, oh. thank you very much. Uh, very uh, happy to be invited today. I'm, I'm going to uh, give a general uh, caveat at the beginning of my lecture. Uh, I am a specialist in sleep medicine. Um, I do occasionally see Parkinson's patients, but it's not necessarily my expertise. But everything we're going to talk about today is something I know very well about and treat on a regular basis. So hopefully I will be able to impart some wisdom for all of you and to help you out. Um, what I decided to do to, so this is basically the overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what normal sleep is and what we consider good sleep hygiene. We're going to talk about some of the sleep disorders uh, in Parkinson's and then uh, discuss some of the specifics of those. So as I said, I thought I'd start with just telling you what sleep is and uh, what we as sleep doctors think about sleep. Because a lot of people, uh, when you think about it, we spend one third of our lives asleep. Um, that's assuming you get eight hours of sleep at night. Um, and yet it's something that most people don't know a lot about. Uh, one of the things we still don't know about, even though it's been years of research on it, is why we do sleep. Um, it's felt to be restorative. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously people who are sleep deprived do not feel well. But the exact reasons for, is it for memory, is it for the body function, is not really clear. What is very clear is that we have two different types of sleep at nighttime. What's called non-REM and REM sleep. REM, REM stands for rapid eye movements. Uh, non-REM sleep is the majority of the night. Uh, it's usually divided into three different stages that you see there. Uh, stage one, uh, most people know when they're hitting stage one sleep, your thoughts get a little discombobulated, a little, you know, out of whack. Then you might wake up and sort of, you know, startle yourself. That's stage one sleep. So you still have some feeling of consciousness. You know, you're aware of what's going on in your environment. Once you get to stage two, um, you're unaware of your environment anymore. And slow wave sleep is the really deep sleep that we all love to get at nighttime. And if you sleep deprive yourself, uh, slow wave sleep is actually the type of sleep that you get um, most of. REM sleep is a very uh, also a very interesting part of the day because uh, we dream during REM sleep. Um, and uh, we are also paralyzed during REM sleep. The only muscle moving is your diaphragm. And when you think about it, that makes sense because otherwise we'd be acting out our dreams. And as we're going to discuss uh, later on, one of the uh, common sleep disorders in Parkinson's disease is a syndrome in which you do act out your dreams. Okay, so we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, later on. During the night, uh, we actually progress through these different stages of sleep in a very uniform way. Although the architecture that I'm showing you up here is considered for that of a 20-year-old, um, and uh, which is considered normal. Now, as it turns out, 20-year-olds are probably not normal when it comes to sleep um, because they probably need more sleep than they actually get. Uh, but this is what's usually considered normal for what's happening during sleep. So if you, if you follow it, and I'll try to point at both screens, uh, we usually progress rapidly from wake down into a slow wave sleep that you see there. About 90 minutes after, our first, after we first fall asleep, we'll have our first REM period. But it's usually pretty short, so you don't usually remember if you're dreaming at midnight, okay? Because it's usually short, you can't actually form a dream. Um, and then basically every 90 minutes or so, we alternate back and forth between non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And as the night goes along, we get less uh, slow wave sleep and more REM sleep. And as you can see, there's a lot of REM sleep at six or seven o'clock in the morning which for many people is when they're waking up, so they tend to remember, you tend to remember your dreams from the latter half of the night uh, because um, they're actually, and one of the ways you can know if you're dreaming is if your alarm clock actually becomes part of your dream. Um, that's a common phenomenon. Uh, so. Now this slide is, basically tells us though that the architecture of our sleep changes with age. And um, one of the things I'm going to show you here is that part of the problem uh, for people with Parkinson's is that you are in the part, in the stages of life where your sleep is already going to be a little bit worse than it was at a younger age. Okay? Um, so that sort of starts you off with a little bit 
off compared to uh, a, a, a otherwise normal person. Basically, um, just, for your, just for your general interest, obviously the biggest sleepers are infants. Um, and uh, they sleep a lot during the day, as you can see right here. Actually, the best sleepers, though, are children. Uh, between the ages of 6 and 10-ish, the average child, if they get 10 hours of sleep at night, should not need any sleep during the daytime. And so they're really the most efficient uh, sleepers out there. Once adolescence comes along, uh, all things start slowly falling apart. Uh, adolescence is partly a problem because society's decided they should stay up and um, go to bed later, get up to high school really early in the morning. Um, usually through uh, adulthood, you can see that in general, your amount of sleep is going down. Uh, your slow wave sleep keeps going down. And by the time you hit uh, the elderly years, which depending on your perspective is not actually that old, um, elderly is usually defined in medicine above 60, 65, which you know, um, is really an old definition at some level because uh, more and more people are hitting 70, 75, but that's what we've got. Um, and by the time you're in that range, you, have, you don't have a lot of slow wave sleep, so you don't necessarily feel that you're getting that deep sleep on a, a nightly basis anymore. More importantly, though, what happens is you start spending more time in bed and less of it asleep, okay? So what's called your sleep efficiency actually decreases as we get older. Um, and this is, so in, even in a totally normal older person, it is common for them to complain that they're just not getting as much sleep or as good sleep as they were when they were younger, okay? And part of that is this uh, being awake in bed more during the night. Now, a lot of elderly people make up for this by napping during the daytime. So if you look at people sleep over 24 hours a period of time, it's often the same as it was when they were younger, but they're, doing, by, they're catching up by taking a half hour, hour nap um, in the middle of the day. Um, and that would actually uh, would be considered relatively normal if you were to, uh, to do that. So what influences when we go to sleep um, and how we sleep? So there's actually two different influences. One is the circadian influence and the other is called homeostatic. So circadian influence means that we have a body clock and based upon that clock, we are sleepier at some parts of the day than others. Now, as it turns out, we are all in this room about to hit our low of the day, okay? Um, I'm actually speaking a little bit before that low. The next speaker gets to speak right in the middle of that low, okay? Uh, <laughs> But uh, usually around 2.30, 3.30 in the afternoon is when we all have a circadian deep in our, dip, dip in our alertness. And, it's, and that's why it's often common if you are going to take a nap in the middle of the afternoon, you often do it at that time of the day because that's when you're most likely going to fall asleep. Um, uh, uh, the other most sleepy part of the time of the day is really in the middle of the night. Okay? But we all should be relatively more alert in the morning and relatively more alert in the evening hours. Homeostatic influences basically say that the more we are awake, the more sleep we need, okay? So if you're up 18, 20, 24 hours, you're going to be sleepier uh, than a person who maybe went to bed after 16 hours, okay? Um, and I always get a laugh out of this when I talk to my residents and students about this, but sleep need is only met by sleeping, okay? There's no other magic way to make up for sleep but to sleep. Okay, and they always laugh because young people are terribly sleep deprived and they would love a magic bullet to stay awake during the day by not sleeping, but they need to sleep. So while those are the influences that are more biologic, there's a lot of other reasons we sleep or don't sleep during the day, uh, or during the, at night. So there's a lot of social and external factors. So your sleeping environment is very key. Um, and uh, as we're going to talk about again in, a, in another couple of slides, rooms in general should be dark, cool, and quiet. The cool is important, okay? It's always easier to throw covers up and over you than to be hot and have to throw them off, okay? Because you can only take off so much. Uh, you can always keep putting on if you need to. So rooms should be dark, cool, and quiet. Um, Emotional factors are very important. So if you go to bed 
angry, upset, uh, just having paid the bills, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you might have a harder time falling asleep at night. The effects of others are clearly important, okay? So this is why a lecture like this is also important for the spouse um, as well as the patient uh, because the sleep of people with sleep disorders, their spouses are often disrupted too. Um, many times, for instance, why people come see me for sleep apnea is they don't know they're snoring, but their spouse can't stand the snoring anymore um, and uh, spending half their night uh, awake. Um, and then there's a lot of different drugs and medications that both alert you and sedate you. And as it turns out, the medications used for Parkinson's do both. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, later on. Uh, but um, there's a lot of other medications out there that uh, can um, keep you awake and help you fall asleep. And not all of them are prescription. So if you were to go out tonight and buy a, a Tylenol PM, uh, you're buying basically Benadryl with Tylenol, and that's going to help you fall asleep at night in theory. Okay? So there's drugs, over-the-counter drugs, that can definitely affect your sleep, and you may not necessarily realize that's happening. There's also a lot of intrinsic illnesses that can affect your sleep. Now, the two most common of those are depression and dementia. So patients with depression uh, generally have a, don't have too much problem falling asleep. Their problem is staying asleep. So they're often very early risers. You know, and they might go find a bed at 10, 10, 11, 10, 11 o'clock at night, but by 4 o'clock in the morning they're awake, they can't go back to sleep again. And that's a common thing in depression. Uh, dementia um, uh, usually starts off uh, with them sleeping okay. They start having then some dis sleep disruption uh, during the night. Slowly but surely, though, patients, some patients with advanced dementia completely flip their clock. Okay? So they will be wide awake at night and their uh, loved ones, and then sound asleep during the day, which of course is very opposite of what the loved ones want to do. Um, and so that's partly, sometimes in people with Alzheimer's, for instance, one of the reasons that they slowly start moving toward doing some type of home health or nursing home is because of that disruption in sleep. If you then look at pretty much medical and neurologic disorders as a group, pretty much all of them can have a sleep problem, okay? Um, uh, it's... Um, unusual for a lot of the major chronic, most of the major chronic illnesses can, be, uh, can affect your sleep. Uh, diabetes, heart disease, la asthma, COPD, um, just for instance, uh, heartburn, horrible heartburn, gastric re reflux disease, all those can definitely affect your sleep. And then many of the neurologic disorders can also affect your sleep, and we're obviously going to talk about Parkinson's today, but that's true of a lot of the other disorders like ALS, uh, myasthenia gravis, uh, also have problems. Also not listed here, I realized, is uh, psychiatric disorders. Most psychiatric disorders are also associated with sleep problems. And so you can see there's a lot of different things that interplay with how you sleep or don't sleep um, at nighttime. So one of the questions that always comes up is how much sleep do you actually need? Um, and the, the official answer is the first bullet there, which is you need as much sleep such that you will be awake and alert throughout the day, okay? Uh, which is the doctor's way of saying that it really is individualized, okay? Um, I do know people who six hours of sleep, they're perfectly fine during the day, okay? I'm not one of them, okay? Um, there are people, though, who need nine hours of sleep a day. We get an average of seven to eight because there are some people at six and some people at nine. Okay? So, there are, so you really do have to do it by your own sort of biology, you know, see how you do. But in general, it is seven to, seven to eight hours for most uh, uh, humans is about how much sleep you really need at nighttime. Now, I'm going to talk about sleep hygiene here.